A very good evening all. I am Aditi Lama with the Thursday night edition of South Asian News, Vision of Asia. We are coming to you from our studio in New York City. Welcome to the show. Let's begin by taking a look at the coronavirus pandemic as well as its impact. The world has surpassed 105 million cases of COVID-19 with more than 2 million deaths. In the United States, we are at 26.6 million coronavirus cases with at least 451,000 deaths. These numbers of deaths come less than two months after reaching 300,000 deaths in December. The first 150,000 deaths by comparison took six months. The U.S. reported more than 21,000 deaths in the week ending yesterday and continues to average of a human toll worse than that of 9-11 every day. We are losing about 3,000 people a day at this current rate. So again, we want to take this time and assert the importance of mitigation strategies of social distancing, hand washing, wearing a mask, and curbing the spread of the coronavirus. We all have to do our part until most of the nation gets vaccinated. Meanwhile, this coming weekend is the much-awaited Super Bowl in Tampa Bay, and experts are asking all to watch Super Bowl on their televisions and to not host parties. The National Football League says it's ready for the final game of the year and expects that its 25,000 spectators will be safe following CDC guidelines with the requirement to wear a mask. In politics, a Senate power sharing agreement was approved that allows Democrats to take the control of committees. Democrats in both chambers are now moving to fast track President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief package. On former President Trump's impeachment, the House impeachment managers requested that the former president testify in the next week's Senate impeachment trial. It's the move to get former President Trump on record on the Capitol riot. Do you think the former president should testify? Send us your comments on our Facebook page at ITV Gold. With that, let's begin looking at the headlines consisting much information and updates on the coronavirus tonight. Dr. Dina Ari Mulam discusses coronavirus updates and vaccine New York City. Dr. Purvi Parikh addresses coronavirus vaccines and high-risk patients New York City. Dr. Janish Kotari discusses COVID-19 variants and mitigation strategies Pennsylvania. Time for a short break on Vision of Asia. Voice of the community will be back shortly. And welcome back. I am Diti Lama and this is Vision of Asia, Thursday night episode of South Asian News. Let's take a look now at the coronavirus updates and measures. More than 26.6 million coronavirus cases with at least 451,000 deaths are here in this nation. U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has projected more than a total of 534,000 by February 27th. The amounts to one death per minute over the last year. This comes as health experts urge for a faster pace, vaccinations ahead of more transmissible variants which they fear could lead to a surge in cases which are currently on a downward trend. Among the coronavirus variants currently most concerning for scientists and public health experts are the UK, South African and Brazilian variants which appear to spread more swiftly than others. The CDC has also expressed concern that the UK variant of COVID-19 is seeming to be more deadly than the original strain. However, it hopes for the vaccines to be effective against the coronavirus variant. This UK variant has been detected in more than 33 states across the nation, including hard-hit California, Florida, New York, Michigan, and others. On COVID-19 variant and the need for continued mitigation efforts, earlier today we spoke with Dr. Janish Kotari. Here is Dr. Kotari. I have some numbers that I'd like to discuss. As of today, I'm looking at 26.6 million cases of COVID-19 with at least 451,000 deaths. Globally, we're looking at 105 million cases and 2.27 million deaths. How are you observing these numbers? We are hearing that exports are predicting a downward trend right now. Do these numbers kind of showcase that? Well, I mean, first thing you have to acknowledge is that these numbers are real. You know, I think the last time we spoke, we were a little less than uh, 100 million cases, you know, and our deaths weren't this high. The U.S. is pretty much totaling about 20 percent of the entire world's, you know, total death that, that have occurred. And they account for about 26 percent of the total cases in the world as well. So we have to look at that from the scope of like, that's obviously not a good thing. But what we've seen is that, like you've mentioned, there's been a downward trend in a lot of these cases. Um, you know, since the first time in uh, November, uh, the U.S. has averaged less than 150,000 cases per day. As for the last two weeks or so, we have had about 114,000 cases per day, which is, like I said, a 30% um, decrease from about two weeks ago. So we're headed in the right direction, I think. 
Right. When we're looking at this, uh, you know, we are seeing surge in parts of the nation, Dr. Qatari, you know, especially in a state like California, where they just have number of cases and the hospitalization are to the max. What is the reason behind this ongoing, you know, surge? And we are also hearing that young adults from 20 to 46 could be responsible for this. What is your comment on that? Um, I think this is probably multifactorial. It kind of stems from a lot of the things that we were talking about the last time I was here. You know, the holidays were upcoming, so people got together with their families and some of their loved ones and friends in the setting of COVID fatigue. And then you put on top of that, this is when the vaccine rollout started happening about in de um, December time. So there was probably a false sense of security that, hey, you know, the vaccine's coming out. Um, I should be a little bit safe when people in, in reality weren't taking into consideration that, uh, you know, it's gonna take some time for this vaccine to take effect. And then there's other more kind of federal government type of issues such as um, lack of mandating mask and the social distancing and having the subtle reopenings of certain venues and things like that. Um, there were weddings going on and other events that, you know, people were trying to reach some sort of normalcy and uh, trying to balance that with the safety precautions. So all those things probably contributed significantly to those um, surges. What's your biggest advice to these hotspot states right now? that may be implementing a mask mandate that have, you know, a stay at home orders going on, what else should they do? I, I think that when we've seen like certain other countries like New Zealand that have pretty much reduced their cases to nothing, they have um, evoked statewide, uh, countrywide lockdowns. Uh, UK is actually on their third lockdown now, you know, so I think that kind of uh, further perpetuating the things that we've always been doing, the social distancing, wearing the mask, um, and then now getting people vaccinated uh, that are applicable in those particular demographic and age groups. And then if we need to do a, you know, uh, another lockdown, that could be something that they will have to consider down the line, but we're hoping that's not what we end up having to do with the vaccine being rolled out. Right. You know, I'd like to now ask you about the COVID variants that is concerning exports all across. Um, how many are you concerned about in the United States? And there is a news that's come out that the UK COVID variant could potentially be more deadly. How are you looking at these variants right now? So, you know, from the beginning of this whole process, we've been tracking the virus and we know that it's gone through a lot of changes. And in particular, um, there have been three variants that have become of interest as per the World um, Health Organization. Uh, the UK one you're talking about, um, it's called B117. And then there's one from Brazil that's called the P1. And then there's one in South Africa that's called the B1351. And the the, the reason why these are concerned because there have been associations that these variants are um, associated with the increased number of cases in these particular countries. And, you know, the scientists that have studied these variants, they have found that the variants tend to spread faster, they're a bit more transmissible, and they appear to be more infectious. So that's kind of the worrying part. In the, 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 the director of CDC, uh, Rochelle Walensky, she was on NBC recently. She basically said that, you know, we know that some of the variants have increased transmissibility and there's increasing data that some of the variants, particularly the B117, which is a UK variant, may actually increase mortality. So I mean, we have to look at these things um, with a grain of salt, and then we have to look at them from a, a long scope. We don't have enough data to kind of tell us what that exactly means. We don't necessarily know if they're exactly more lethal. We just know that they're much more transmissible. We don't know if they increase the severity of disease. Um, a, of interest, Denmark is, you know, they had this whole massive virus sequencing of effort that they did. And, you know, they were able to isolate um, that the, the UK variant is starting to become the more predominant um, strain. And by March, it should probably even peak, at least in the United States. The scientists in Denmark, um, they, they found that about 1.5 times, it, that's how much more um, um, infectious it could be. And, you know, we started to see these variants in, in, in America, Colorado, um, Alaska, California, we, um, and Florida, those are all places that have had this. Right. You know, we're also hearing news on these variants that they could potentially reinfect people who have had COVID-19. Have you seen that so far or what are you hearing about that? Um, when this, the, the 
the UK variant came out, there's researchers from the UK of Biobank, I believe it's called. Uh, they found that people that were infected with COVID-19, they end up keeping their antibodies for about three to six months. And however, if you come in contact with another strain of the virus, such as the ones that have been highly contagious in UK, we don't necessarily know if these antibodies have, that have been made to the initial strain are protective against uh, the new strain. In theory, they should be because that's kind of the, the premise that we've been using when the vaccine um, has started becoming, um, was rolled out. And then when the variants started coming out, people were like, hey, is the vaccine gonna work? So in theory, it should work. So, but we do know that people can be reinfected. Well, looking at the coronavirus pandemic, experts are now saying that young adults from the age of 20 to 49 are driving the spread of COVID-19 and are the reason behind these recent surge in cases. It is estimated that about 65% of new U.S. infections originate from the age group of 20 and 49. Therefore, doctors and medical professionals across the nation are urging young adults to not gather or host parties, especially with the Super Bowl coming this weekend, as they could be asymptomatic carriers of the virus and can also spread it to vulnerable people and individuals at high risk. Meanwhile, Director of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Walonsky, today said that schools can perhaps reopen safely even if the teachers are not vaccinated for the coronavirus. She stated that the data shows social distancing and wearing a mask can significantly reduce the spread of COVID-19 in school setting. However, this has gotten teachers and educators concerned about their well-being across the nation as reopening without getting vaccinated increases their chance of contracting the virus. More on the coronavirus and its impact, we have now another segment with Dr. Dina Mulan. What, according to you, should the federal government be doing when it comes to the vaccination program? Because there has been a huge call for a national plan for these vaccines. I think the most important thing really at this time is that we need to really work on um, supply. I think we have you know, supply from two major pharmaceutical companies right now but it's just not enough. So the hope is that more and more companies will come up with different vaccination options. We have a few on the horizon already that will allow for us to increase uh, the supply of the vaccine to meet the demands of the people. I also think it's important um, to look at certain areas where there are hot spots within certain states, for example, that they know the infection rate is very high. Those are places that maybe we need to consider targeting because that's where the infection is going to spread and it's going to spread to other areas very quickly. So I think in terms of supply and in terms of distribution, these two goals should be met to try to curb the cases um, as well as to help protect a larger number of individuals. Does it matter which vaccine we end up getting? What is the efficacy of both of the vaccines? So both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are what's available right now, and they're both equally as efficacious. So if you can get either of them, that's you, you should definitely consider either of those vaccines. You know, really, the only negative um, in relation to Pfizer versus Moderna is Pfizer needs to be stored at ultra cold temperatures versus Moderna, which can be stored at just freezer temperatures. Um, and as we know, the Pfizer vaccine is offered to people 16 and over versus Moderna, which being given to 18 years and over. So those are the main differences. In relation to the side effect profile, I would say that my colleagues who received the vaccine as well as um, other individuals, really the side effect profile is pretty similar between the both of them. Right. And, you know, just talking about the vaccine, AstraZeneca says that its vaccine appears to reduce transmission of the coronavirus and can protect up to three months with just one dose. Um, how are you looking at this? What is AstraZeneca trying to do? So I think it's really promising data that came out um, with the AstraZeneca trial because most of our studies so far with vaccinations have been looking at efficacy, meaning how effective is this at preventing COVID-19 infection or hospitalization or severe disease and hospitalization and death. But this is the first time we're actually looking at transmittability data, meaning what is the likelihood of somebody who's been vaccinated actually being able to um, not transmit this infection to somebody else. So in some way, it's nice to see some data in the realm of transmission because it really hasn't been looked at thus far, but we just don't know exactly what the data shows as of yet. This is new study that has you know, just recently been 
um, shown to the public. So once it's come under a peer review, I think we'll learn a lot more about how they were actually understanding transmission. Was this the way that we should look at transmission data to be able to really um, say that this is a conclusive result? Right. You know, I just have two more questions left here for you, doctor. I have to ask you, you are an endocrinology specialist and you deal with a lot of at high risk patients, especially South Asians. Have you seen any interaction between COVID-19 and these patients? And how concerned are you about them until they get the vaccines? So I'm very concerned about our South Asian population, um, mainly because, you know, within our South Asian community, things like diabetes, heart disease um, are quite rampant. And we know that diabetes and heart disease are two major comorbidities that can increase one's risk of having severe COVID um, infection and death. So I think it's extremely important for those people who are considered high risk to really be careful to make sure that they're staying home as as long as they can to make sure that they're wearing a mask whenever possible to make sure that they're doing all social distancing measures like washing hands, etc, to make sure they decrease their risk of having COVID-19. I think, you know, we've been in this pandemic for oh, more than a year now, and people yeah. are suffering from what's called COVID fatigue. It's really easy to just let down your guard. You're with your family members who happen to be visiting and you only have four people in your house. Maybe you feel comfortable because of your family to take off your mask, but really that's not the right thing to do. You can only take off your mask around people that are within your quarantine team, people that you're living with and anyone else coming from outside, they need to be looked at as a potential source of COVID-19 and you need to protect yourself. Time for another short break on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community. We'll be back shortly. And welcome back. I am Diti Lama and this is Vision of Asia, South Asian news segment. We are looking at key COVID-19 updates and measures on the show tonight. On vaccines, global vaccine confidence is rising with more people saying that they will take the vaccine if given. And COVAX, a vaccine sharing initiative, announced its plan to distribute more than 330 million doses to developing nations. Meanwhile, in the United States, the rollout of vaccination program continues to be slow and is concerning experts. Nearly 60,000 million vaccine doses have been distributed in the U.S. and about 39 million have been administered. Bringing in a ray of hope are two vaccines that could be joining Moderna and Pfizer. AstraZeneca says its vaccine has shown 66.7% efficacy and has said that their vaccine could reduce the severity of the disease. It also said one dose of AstraZeneca vaccine could give up protection to three months. Meanwhile, Johnson & Johnson is expected to apply for the FDA approval for emergency use authorization of its one-dose vaccine candidate. Bringing insight into vaccines, earlier today we spoke with Dr. Purvi Parekh, who also commented on at high risk South Asians. Here is Dr. Parekh. Talk a little bit more about the vaccines because I know we're getting a lot of information from you on them. My question to you again, the rollout is still very slow, even after the new administration has taken over. What do you think is the reason now? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, the problem is, every state is doing something differently. Uh, and, and so I think we need a better organized approach. I also think I, I understand why there's certain priority groups and restrictions, but I think at this point we need to loosen many of the restrictions because the problem is, you know, there are people that want the vaccine that can't access it. There's, you know, doses that are being wasted at the end of the day. So there needs to be mechanisms in place that, yes, you know, um, you know, certain amount of doses are reserved for high priority groups. But then there needs to be some leeway, whether it be at the end of the day where people can come either in the walk in basis or a wait list basis and get the vaccine, you know, even if they're not on a high priority group, because it doesn't make sense to waste or throw away doses when we need to get everybody vaccinated, ideally, you know. Also, all the states need to have the same criteria, you know, like one state is saying elderly is 75 and over, another is saying it's 65 and over. So it, it's very disorganized. So I think that needs to happen. Um, hopefully the Defense Act will be activated so we can visit, make more doses, you know, so there's a lot of logistical barriers. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is uh, vaccine hesitancy. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of people who are afraid of the vaccine, who don't believe in the vaccine or think conspiracy theories are true. And, and it's quite tragic because the real virus, I think, is far scarier than the vaccine. 
Right. You know, just talking more about the vaccine, doctor. Today, experts are coming up with a study in which they are trying to use different doses of Moderna and Pfizer for one person to see if both the doses could be worked um, in case we are running out of doses in one you know, pharmaceutical company. Um, how do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't studied that way initially, so mm-hmm. I would not do it without testing it first, you know, to make sure that it still produces good immunity comparable to what happened in the studies. Um, so, I mean, if it does show that we can interchange the doses, that's great. But I, again, would caution against just jumping to doing that without actually testing it first. And testing it does take time. So, you know, same way that we tested the others, um, we're going to have to follow these uh, people over at least, you know, a few months to see if it produces the same type of immunity, make sure there's no um, side effects, that un- unintended side effects or consequences. Right. Um, on the vaccine more, Dr. Parikh, AstraZeneca is saying that its vaccine appears to reduce transmission of the coronavirus. One dose can protect up to three months. Um, what are you hearing about it, about AstraZeneca? I know it's not approved in the U.S. yet, but it's being used mm-hmm. in different parts of the world. Yeah, you know, I think that's great news, you know, because like we were saying earlier, uh, 40% of the cases are asymptomatic transmission, you know, so all of us could be passing it on to each other without knowing it. So if um, a vaccine does prove that it stops transmission, as well as infection, that's huge, especially when we have these more contagious variants, right, that can move from person to person quicker. Um, So I think it's great news. I know um, AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson, people are concerned that it's quote unquote, less effective, but that's actually um, not true. You can't really compare them alongside the other vaccines. It's like apples and oranges because they still show that they're going to save your life. There's zero deaths. They're going to significantly reduce hospitalizations, ICU stays. That's, you know, that's a scary stuff that comes along with COVID-19 and and they'll make you less likely to get so sick that, you know, God forbid you have a terrible outcome. Like, stroke or kidney damage or, you know, other organ damage. So um, absolutely, like, again, I can't say it enough. Take a vaccine. It doesn't matter which one you get. They will all save your life. That's what the the data is showing. And we're hearing that Johnson & Johnson could get an emergency use uh, authorization. Um, And that's only a one dose vaccine, if I'm right. How do you see that changing the way we're giving our vaccines and the, the rollout as well? Yeah, I think the one dose it will is great. You know, it will speed up things significantly because currently it takes like, you know, at least a month to get one person vaccinated, right? And it, then it's really a full six week period to get full immunity because even after that month, the next day I'm not fully immune. It takes my immune system a week or two to then make the immunity. So if, if it's one dose that cuts down that lead time in half, essentially. So that would be huge. We could get so many more people vaccinated quickly without having to worry about the logistics of dose number two. Well, this wraps up our show for the night. Please send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations on our show. Email us on events at itvgold.com or follow us on Facebook at ITV Gold. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for free access to many of our popular shows. Thank you for joining us tonight from Queens, New York. This is Vision of Asia and I am with Lamba. Take care and be well. Thank you.